If you're not making money, it doesn't matter how much you love it. At a certain point, it will become a resentment because you're working so hard and you're barely making it. And I meet those teachers every day and they're just so frustrated. Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists looking for in-depth, career-accelerating conversations about all that's new and neat for clarinet. On today's episode, I'm joined by Kelly Reardon, who is a clarinetist, pedagogue, and co-founder of Outside the Box, that's B-A-C-H-S, a program designed to support musicians in creating their own private music studios. We discuss why it's okay to make money making music, how to build your studio, why you might want to consider business coaching, distancing music from money, and much, much more. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank all our sponsors and supporters for making the show possible, including Kelly's company, which you'll hear more about the offer that she has for Clarinet listeners in just a second. I'd also like to thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, tell your clarinet friends, colleagues, and students, and I hope that you enjoy the show. As musicians, we are always trying to improve our playing and understanding of music, but we're often hesitant to work on the business and marketing side of music. If you're looking to make more money teaching, fill up the gaps in your studio and find ideal clients to work with who leave you feeling energized instead of drained after a day of teaching, you need to check out clarinetist Kelly Reardon's Outside the Box community. Get a free 30-minute consultation and personalized recommendations from Kelly by mentioning Clarinet when you register at kellyreardon.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-R-I-O-R-D-A-N.com. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code CLARINET at checkout. Imagine a reed that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reeds, the world's leading synthetic reed brand made right here in Canada. The European cut reed is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crowder Giuffredi, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. Learn more at your local music store. Or you can now save 10% on your Legere reads with code CLARINET at checkout at Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. I'm here on the podcast today with Kelly Reardon, who is the co-founder of Outside the Box. And that, of course, is spelled B-A-C-K-H. So, Kelly, welcome to the podcast. I love the name of your business. (laughs) Thank you, Sean. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So I think it's so great that you are helping musicians think literally outside of the box, B-O-X as well. (laughs) And uh, so I really look forward today to talking about a lot of sort of music business concepts and uh, sort of what you do and sort of the unique career path that you have. Um, I'm really excited because the last few uh, podcast episodes have featured some some podcast guests with really sort of interesting careers and uh, you are definitely one of those people. So, um, but before we dive into that, I was wondering if you could give the audience just a quick sort of introduction to you as a clarinetist and maybe even as a person so we could get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as a clarinetist, I started clarinet when I was eight, a little early on on the early side of things, but I'd been playing piano for a while. I was convinced that I wanted to play French horn because my mom's mom happened to be a, a phenomenal French horn player. That was what I thought I wanted, but at eight years old, I was tiny. And so she told me, try something smaller to start, maybe clarinet. So I went out and rented a clarinet the next week and, and fell absolutely in love. Uh, I was practicing off of like VHS, you know, tape recording instruction videos in my basement for a few months before my mom got me lessons and uh, loved it from the start. I studied at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee for my undergrad with Professor Todd Levy, who congrats to him, was just appointed at Northwestern University recently for the fall term. It'll be really cool. And then I went on for my master's degree at University of Georgia, studied there under Dr. David McClellan and dove a lot into chamber music. And that's what I spent most of my, my graduate degree working on. So big fan of chamber ensembles. That's most of my performance these days as things are kind of coming back into performance time. A lot of, a lot of small group ensemble performances and that's really where my passion in performing lies. 
I love that. So before we move too much for, uh, more forward in your life, I want to talk about starting as a young uh, clarinetist, if you don't mind, because I mean, yeah, go for it. It's interesting, but uh, the difference between eight and twelve years, you know, I'm realizing as a dad myself, like every you know day for a child is a long time. So like eight to twelve years, that's like another half of a lifetime for a kid. So I started at twelve. You starting at eight. I know physically it's hard. Mentally, it must be difficult too to play the clarinet. So what was it like starting at that age? And do you think that helped you on your clarinet journey? And do you think others should maybe start early too? That's a lot of questions packed in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So first off, I, I definitely think it helped me start early because I had a passion for it. I think if I had waited, my parents were smart in the fact that when I showed an interest, they just kind of leaned in. And honestly, they did everything like that in my life, which I really appreciate looking back on. Um, you know, I was recently married and as you know, we start that kind of conversation of what does our family look like when I look at how my parents kind of uh, embraced those passions and figured we can try anything once it, with pretty much every interest that I had. I think it's a, a really admirable admirable trait that they had. And so I spent a summer at an engineering camp because I thought I wanted to work for NASA when I was in sixth grade. And you know, it, it, there's so many examples like that throughout my life. But when it came to clarinet, I said I was interested. And my mom literally went to the music store the next week and came home with a little Vito plastic clarinet rental for me. And I think that kind of excitement and embrace of those hobbies and interests meant a lot because if I was excited about something, they would invest the time and energy into it. And it was really helpful. So capturing that attention early, I think was a, a big advantage for me. On starting younger students, it's absolutely a possibility. At eight, my hands were very small. I'm still tiny. I'm only five foot two. So my hands are still small, which is a little bit of a disadvantage in some ways. But uh, there are clarinets now that are made for younger students. So there's like nouveau instruments. They've got the dude and the clarineo. They're awesome. And they're a smaller bore because they're in C clarinet. So they're a little smaller, but they're made for tiny hands. So I have a few students that play on those and they're, they're really good. Years ago, I had them on the podcast. Really? Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, and I have actually the Clarineo because um, they had sent me some products to try back then too. And so I still have the Dude and the Clarineo and J Sachs or something and a couple others. Yeah, and, yeah. And my daughter has been trying them out already a little bit. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they're like indestructible. Those things are great. You can like, put them through the dishwasher. It doesn't even matter. And literally, you can. Yeah. I have, yeah, I've had good good experience with those. You know, they, they are plastic, but they sound pretty decent, honestly. So. Well, they had such smart marketing, too, because you mentioned they can you know, go in the dishwasher. I remember it, uh, I think it was Midwest I went to when they were there. They literally had a big tank of them all submerged to show that they were washable. And I was like, that is pretty oh cool. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I used so. to work at a music store when I was in high school, and there was a dad that came in that had put the rental clarinet through a dishwasher, and oh, all wow. the pads were exploded, and it was an absolute nightmare. So as soon as I heard that, I was like... <laughs> totally sold because seen it happen. You, you, yeah. It's absolutely wild to, to see what people do to instruments. My gosh. Well, especially nowadays <laughs> when people want them to be, you know, sanitized and stuff. But Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that is so interesting because not many people start that young. So I was interested kind of to hear, you know, what it was like. And I, I think you're right. If you have a passion for something, it doesn't really matter when you start because you're going to sort of just make it work. But I think that if generally we started kids that young, they would get frustrated, you know? And I think that there's a big sort of fun element that's a, you know, that's, that's relevant for kids at that age too. Like, I mean, my daughter, I bought her one of those, uh, uh, it's like a little tiny Fender affinity short scale guitar. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely a bit early for her to have that, but I, you know, she's really interested in music and I think she's going to play that for quite a few years and even just to dabble around on it, make some sound. She's figured out the volume button changes stuff now. And it's just, you know, it's just fun at this point. So. Well, and I have a student right now who's in, she's currently a fifth grader. So she just turned 10 and she started last year. So she's been playing since she had like, I think she was about eight and a half at that, at that time. And she's in the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. She's the youngest one player they have this year. She's absolutely a, a fantastic player and she's very focused. Claire is what she loves and it's what she does. And one of the things I'm really conscientious of with her is making sure that we always have something else that we're working on because school band will start for everyone else next year. And she is eons ahead of her peers that she's going to be sitting next to. And I think it's easy to sit. And when I look back at my own self, it's easy to sit in that chair and be like, well, this is, this is easy. So now I either need a different challenge because now I'm just bored in, in band class and I'm, I don't want to do this. Or, you know, I, everyone tells me I'm wonderful at this. Everyone tells me I'm good at it. So 
you know, I don't have to put that much effort in. I can slack off a little bit, right? Like I'm just good at clarinet. So I I can, I can relax a little bit. I'm always, always the best, no matter what happens at, at that stage of the game. And so I think when I was like in sixth and seventh grade, I did slow down a little bit in my practice. It picked up again when I was in eighth grade and I had goals again. You know, I want to be first chair. I want to, you know, in, in or youth orchestra, or I want to make the next ensemble, but it's hard to keep that interest. So with my, my younger student, Abby, I am constantly trying to find more things that she wants to learn or, um, you know, work on different exercises with her and kind of change it up as much as possible so that we have little sessions of material, but we, we keep it rotating through what she's interested in. Whatever's going to keep her practicing is my priority at this point. So she stays engaged. That's really good. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that about, you know, kind of, um, you know, not putting in more effort because you're already better at it. And I remember when I was in band, I was, uh, you know, basically top of the class all through junior high school and, and I even won some awards for like top band student and stuff like that, like every year, except for the middle year, ironically, because they thought I lied on my practice sheet because there was too many hours. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I went from 99 to like 97 and a half percent and didn't get it that year. But anyway, you're right. It was tough to convince me and my family that I should get some lessons because it's like, well, you wouldn't tell the top math student to get tutoring, would you? I mean, I don't know. It, it just seemed weird. Like, why do I need the lessons? <laughs> and my family wasn't musical, so that wasn't really... Um, a thing. So speaking of lessons, let's talk about how you got into what you do with Outside the Box. And uh, it looks like you have a very sort of interesting lesson studio yourself, but also you've started coaching and guiding other musicians on their journey to build a viable um, music and lessons business. So let's talk about how you transitioned from all the great playing you do and chamber music and passion for the clarinet into the business side of things, because it's not a normal trans- transition. Most people don't get <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, when I was in uh, high school, actually, I started teaching private lessons. Um, it was obviously what I loved was clarinet. And so I was spending all my time there. I was working for a local music store. Uh, I had a phenomenal teacher that I was with for eight years. She started me when I was eight after those VHS tapes ran out pretty quickly. She was the the first teacher that I studied with. And then I was with her through my junior year of high school. And she had a couple inquiries that she couldn't really take on. And they were students who were just starting out as beginners. And she was really generous with kind of sharing some information and helping me get started as a teacher and informing me in pedagogy, making sure that I was doing the right things and relaying the right information. But I took on a couple like fifth and sixth grade students when I was in high school and I loved teaching. And it was exciting for me to see the results that my students were getting and to see them progress. And it was a little addicting. I I felt like, you know, I, I could make so much impact through helping them that, um, seeing that joy and seeing that passion develop in them felt amazing because it wasn't just like, obviously they love clarinet. They were going to love clarinet no matter what, but now we also are fun in our lessons and they're making their goals and they're achieving all, all these wonderful things and you know, they're top of their class. And I'm proud of them and I'm proud of the work that they're doing. And I'm proud of the impact that I had through them. So when I was in high school, I really enjoyed teaching. So I just kept going, um, taught part-time through my undergrad and my graduate degrees. Uh, taught a little bit more of my undergrad, actually, my graduate degree, I, I ended up doing a little bit of other work to help fund it. But I also happened to find myself in marketing. When I was in my undergraduate degree, it was uh, approached uh, kind of on a cold approach one day by a brand rep for an energy drink company. And they asked if I would consider working for their marketing department for events and I honestly, it paid better than the university recreation job that I had at the time. So I said, sure, why not? And it was like, it was good money. It was like 15 bucks an hour, which at that time was, was really heavy. So I started doing that in undergrad and it kind of led the summer between my undergrad and graduate years to a lot of event planning and a lot of event marketing. And we moved on to Georgia for my graduate program. Atlanta is a huge event uh, marketing space because there's obviously a lot of a, a lot of big sports that were happening. The Super Bowl was down there when we were when we were living down there, but it also is a huge epicenter for films and film production. So I tapped into that a little bit. We were doing a lot of um, product based marketing in particular, but all of my experience was in planning organic outreach events. So I was working with all these brands: uh, American Express, Cadillac. Uh, Red Bull, Anheuser-Busch, just a a lot of different companies doing this marketing on the side. And it was really flexible. So I could do that on the weekends and it was paying for my degree. It was wonderful. 
So when I, you know, long story short, I got out of graduate degree program and I looked around and thought, I need money, I need a job. And I don't really want to work in marketing. I want to stay in music. I'm afraid if I don't get a music job now, I'll never come back to it. So I just dove head first into teaching and took all that marketing experience and applied it to my studio. And it grew fast. I had about 43 students in two and a half months when we moved back to Wisconsin. Wow. Yeah, it was quick. <laughs> <laughs> For those listening, I mean, um, do you play other instruments too? Like, can you teach piano or guitar or are you, is this all clarinet? Because I know that one of the struggles I had as a clarinet net teacher when I was trying to build my studio and I went through phases. I went through what I would describe as kind of a building phase where I would basically say yes to everybody. And then I went through sort of a sustained phase where I was able to turn people down and, and focus more on clarinet again because I'd been teaching some beginner guitar and piano and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, and then I went through kind of a growing past it phase. I, I don't know. I, I wanted to perform more and teach less and now I don't teach at all. So um, it just kind of <laughs> changed for me. And I don't know if everyone that's the trans sort of, sort of a transformative kind of event that they want, but. Yeah, I definitely, so I teach piano lessons and that definitely helps. Yes. Um, I think when I had the 43, about 18 or 19 of them were piano, I believe. Uh, and I am a, I'm a strong pianist. I, piano was my, actually my first instrument when I started studying when I was young. I took lessons on and off through my collegiate career, but obviously clarinet was where I got my degrees. So I only teach beginning into early intermediate piano. And then I have a, a long list of fantastic colleagues that I try to place my students with the right fit uh, that I, I think who they'll, they'll really get along with well or whose style they'll, they'll work with the best once they're at that point. But right now I don't have any piano students. So it's definitely something that you know, I, I kind of phased out of as my students got to a certain point in their playing, I, I passed them off or at the end of a term, I would pass them on to another teacher that would be a good fit for them. And I had a long wait list at that point. Um, this was all fall of 2019. So by the time the pandemic hit, my wait list was about 17. And those were almost all clarinet students. I wasn't waitlisting any piano students. I was just turning them away. So I was able to, over time, just you know start to sub those out and, and make the transition to only clarinet. So I don't want to spill the beans on all your strategies and th things people might come to you to get <laughs> oh, help no, with. Oh, no, you're but, good. I'm an open book. <laughs> but like, so walk me through that because like a lot of people struggle to get a student a month or a student a semester and 43 students, did you say two and a half months? Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, my quick math. That's very poor. It would be like, what, is that five, 10 students a week, basically, you know? Yeah, it was fast. It was fast. And the first week or two, you know, it's more like two or three. Right. It, it takes a little little time to get the ball rolling. Once we decided that we were moving to Wisconsin, I started doing some outreach. I, I knew kind of roughly what area we were going to settle. It's about halfway between where my parents live and where my husband's parents live. So far enough away that like the high school I went to wasn't really going to help me <laughs> and any connections that he had weren't really going to help me. But I knew people in the area, so I was able to, to kind of start some outreach. And the first thing that I did was call all the teachers that I knew in the area that I, I respected, that had studios that were really strong. You know, I mentioned I used to work at a, a private music or at a music store, and that was attached to a, a lesson conservatory where all the teachers are independent. They run their own businesses. You know, they're, they're not employees or anything. It's all independent contractor. So I knew quite a few of them, and I called them and said, how, how do you make this work? Like what works best for you? What are some best practices, policies, all that? And I just compiled a whole bunch of information. And then my, like I said, my background in marketing is all organic. So I was looking for events that I could go to, to do outreach. I was looking for opportunities to connect with people in the community that could refer to me and, and help me build the studio. And I was looking for opportunities to really build relationships ongoing. We all kind of have made that, that I don't want to call it a mistake, but we've all written that email to a band director that says like, Hey, I'm a local clarinet teacher. Got any students that are, are looking for lessons. And you know, most of those emails go unanswered. So I was looking for a, a, a way to build a relationship on trust that I'm not just like a stranger on the internet that you're going to pass your, your precious students off to, but I'm someone that you respect as an instructor and as a teacher that you respect my expertise. I would say that I respect yours as the band director, the, the main source of their music education at this point. And we have a really good professional working relationship that you're comfortable referring students to me and you want to refer students to me and not someone else in the community. So a lot of that was through, uh, you know, offering not just master classes, but actually offering to teach the entire band class for a day um, and, and trying to find opportunities to get in front of the entire band because 
when you have a sectional or master class, you're only with the clarinet students or maybe just the woodwind students and the teacher never actually sees you teach. Yeah. Right. So then they have to like trust the high school students to tell them that you're a good teacher. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that might not go very far. Right. So I wanted it to be something where they could take the entire hour off, put their feet up. They didn't have to lesson plan. They didn't have to direct nothing. How can I make an impact for them in one day? Right. So I can teach practice techniques that's applicable to everyone. I can talk about the history of the wind ensemble and how we get to this point. Um, I can you know, do audition preparation with the entire ensemble. We can talk about you know, performance mindset and, and performance health. There's so many opportunities there to talk to the entire group and not just the clarinet section. And that also means that if it's the entire group and we have the whole room, that if you're doing you know, performance techniques or, or um, you know, healthy, healthy production, we might be able to do some Alexander technique. We can get them up and moving and it's fun and it's engaging and it's not just an hour lecture of them sitting in a chair and me talking at them. And that's a really impactful thing that the students remember, but it also just shows, you know, the, the level of education and instruction that I can provide and the engagement that I can get from students. And that was a huge help too. I love that. And, you know, it's something to be said too, for just inspiration of seeing someone in the career path uh, with a lot of other fields. I know they bring in a lot of guests sometimes. Like I remember when I was in school, we'd have a presenter sometimes for, you know, this guy's a scientist or this person's a whatever. And, but I don't remember there being a musician coming in outside of the clinicians and stuff that we saw really. And I, I think even I did a, a workshop this past weekend called the Vic Lewis Music Festival. And um, I make sure to start off every session, if I remember, because there's like 16 or 20 sessions <laughs> really quick going by. But, but I try to introduce myself and like explain, you know, some of the stuff I do and, you know, what a music career that's a little unorthodox could look like. Like, you know, I play, I do some teaching, I do some clinicking, I work for a major, major manufacturer now and I run the podcast and like I do all sorts of stuff. And I don't think people realize that it, it can be like that. I think they think that whatever their stereotype is of just like, just teaching lessons or just playing or just a band teacher or whatever. They don't realize the whole breadth of what being a musician might sort of be. So um, let's dive a little bit more into kind of what you've done for some other, some other studios then, because I'm seeing on, on your website here, for example, um, I don't know how to word this, but like they sound like bold claims. Let's put it that way. You know, <laughs> so-and-so has increased their studio by three times and, you know, three weeks and he's now making $5,000 a month or whatever. I mean, <laughs> to a lot of people, especially right now coming out of this pandemic where income is something they really need to take seriously getting back into, are these realistic levels of achievement for most people if they apply your techniques or are these kind of isolated one-off cases? Yeah. I don't know how to word that non-offensively. But <laughs> no, no, you, you're not offending me at all. That's a, that is a fantastic question. So uh, let me kind of back up a, a moment this whole like coaching business coach consultant, you know, whatever you want to call it, this program, um, this was something I never intended to do. I never thought of myself as a coach or consultant when the pandemic shut everything down. I had a handful of colleagues. Initially it was my older colleagues that I, I happened to know in the area that could not use zoom to save their life. And they were panicking on, on how to maintain their business. And so I started helping them learn how to teach online. And, and I'd, I'd done some online lessons when I was in grad school for a couple of students that were still in Wisconsin. So I was familiar and I was able to kind of coach them through that. And then word kind of spread from there and my studio had grown fast. So then people were asking me, you know, how to build a studio and how to find more students because they had attrition at the beginning of the pandemic. So that was March and April and May of 2020. I was just getting on Zoom with colleagues, friends, friends of friends, and just helping. And in, by June of 2020, people were calling me that I never met before and asking for my advice. And it was just fun. Like it was fun to connect with people I didn't know. It was fun to hear from other studios and what they were doing. And you know, I was kind of learning from them and I was able to share my expertise. By August of 2020, a friend of mine who is not a musician, but works in, in, in business consulting, sat me down and said, you have a business and you're spending like 20 to 40 hours a week on Zoom with people that you don't know, you might want to start charging for it. And I didn't really realize that I'd accidentally found myself in that position. So I hired a business coach myself because I'm like, I, I don't know how to run a consulting firm. How do we, how do we get this started? And we were off to the races. So it's been a very organic process for me. I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm glad that I accidentally found myself here, but I'm also glad that it was an accident because it just feels 
like this is where I was meant to be. And it's been a really wonderful way for me to, to help during this really tumultuous time, tumultuous time and uh, try to make an impact in the music industry, which I'm thrilled with. So the claims, yes, they are bold. <laughs> a lot of them are really big. And of course, you know, you're, you're kind of seeing that the highlight reel, but in the first, you know, four weeks or so of a, a studio being in our program, most studi studios are seeing about two to six students enrolling in the first four or five, six weeks on average. Um, by the end of the program, you know, we have significant progress made towards filling their studio, but that looks different for every person. Some people work faster than others. Um, some people are more consistent. It's just like practice. If, you know, you, you check off the boxes every day and you're, you're working on those actionable steps and we're making meaningful progress, the faster we work through those things, the more consistent we work through those things, the faster we're going to get results, right? If we take days off, if we take weeks off, if we're a little bit more sporadic in how we're approaching things, then sure, it's going to be a little bit slower and it's totally fine too. Everyone has their own pace and everyone has the same goals. You know, I've got clients that are making $10,000 a month and that's not something that everyone wants. Some people just really want, you know, three to $4,000 a month of really steady, stable income and we can make that happen too. So a lot of different goals and a lot of different strategies to get there, but absolutely there's a, there's a range of success but I, I am proud to say that everyone that we work with, um, I'm very involved directly in their studios. I want to make sure that they're successful. So every studio that goes through our program does see growth and success. I love that. You know, you're totally right about the amount of money that someone can make. I mean, sometimes it can be almost too many students. You have to start turning them down and, and, and getting to a point where you're like, okay, well, I could make an extra $50 a day or a week or whatever, but like I need my own time back too, you know? Um, and so I have a secondary question about that, but, but before we get to it, that one, I have a first question. <laughs> so do you find that musicians are a little bit dismissive of this concept that they can make a living? And I don't, again, I'm trying to find a way to word that that's not going to <laughs> offend people. But like, I remember when I was teaching a lot of students, I had like also probably close to 40 students a week. I had like five or seven a day. I was doing clinics and gigs and like, I was, you know, in my area at the time, you could charge 50 to $70 an hour for a lesson. So if I had a whole evening of lessons booked every night and work all day, I mean, it was pretty easy to get to quite a bit of money, <laughs> you know, and um, I'm not saying I was raking it in, but I was living a fairly comfortable lifestyle, able to afford things that, you know, people would be generally surprised. Like, oh, well, how are you driving a car? Well, I make payments on it like like you might, you know, or <laughs> like someone yeah. else does, you know, and and I find a lot of musicians like one time I was out with this person and, uh, oh, I got to go. I got to teach oh, how many students do you have? And I was like, oh, five. They're like, this week? And I said, no, no, today. And they were like, what? Like that to them, that was incomprehensible. So like, how do you get past this? Like so many musicians are in this sort of limited mindset, very closed off to like opportunity. And they, they can't really, sometimes I feel anyways, I've noticed they, they can't accept that they might become successful. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, does that, is that yeah. a stupid thing to say? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. No, and, and honestly, this is a large part of what I work with musicians on. A lot of people already have the tools. Like they don't, you know, do I have a little secret sauce? Sure. But a lot of it's just, you know, the same things that you might consider trying on your own, like reaching out to band directors. I can just get you there a little faster because I can expedite the process for you and tell you like what exact wording to use and what wording not to use, right? I, I can just refine that faster for you. So that type of engagement in their studios is not necessarily what they need. I think 90% of the studios that we work with, they really need some help in this mindset area. That's actually what's holding them back. And, you know, you hear, um, there's a lot of like audition coaches now and audition consultants out there that run courses and programs now too. And they talk about this a lot that people always put a lot of weight that this audition has to be the audition. Right. And if you kind of remove that mindset of the right audition will happen for me, the right opportunity will come for me. And I just have to take all the auditions so that when I'm actually the right fit for someone, they'll want me and I'm, and I'm ready for that. There's a little bit of a, a switch there too. So the first thing that I think has to happen in a musician's mindset is we have to kind of fix what we might've experienced in our own lessons and also make sure that we don't perpetuate that. When I was growing up, I had a, a wonderful teacher who was very engaging, but by the time I was getting into that kind of college audition season and taking lessons with a lot of different teachers and trying to figure out where I wanted to go to school, I had a lot of lessons that I went to where I was just told all of the things I was bad at. And 
that's not only deflating, right? And of course you want critique like that. You want to get better. That's not the problem. But if we only tell our students the things they're not good at, and we don't praise them for the things they are good at, the things they're good at start to fall by the wayside. They stop focusing on them, right? And we still have to keep practicing that. If you tell someone that their upper body is really strong, but their legs need work, if they stop lifting their you know, upper body, then they're going to have weak arms too. And now, now we haven't achieved a desired result. So there's a balance between affirmation and praise and support, and then also making sure that they're aware of what we need to keep working on and giving them the tools and resources to do that. But we haven't had that experience. A lot of us have just been told what we're bad at week after week after week. And over time, that really starts to eat at your psyche. And it is a little traumatizing when you take a pause and look back on it and, and actually think about what happened. So that's something that a lot of teachers, not everyone, of course, has had that experience, but a lot of teachers are, are kind of carrying that baggage. A lot of us are carrying a lot of performance anxiety where if it's not perfect, we don't bring it to the stage. Yeah. Right. And that's a huge issue in business. Business is all about making mistakes. Like you have to go try something and then you reiterate, like go try a copy, you know, a, a post copy in a Facebook group. And if it bombs, then we try it again. And we have to have that process for, for testing and uh, for refining things. So if we don't have that process, we don't have that capability to just be okay with things not working and needing to do them again, then it, it definitely holds us back. But the final piece of the mindset is, this mindset that I call a thriving musician mindset as opposed to the starving artist. And that part of the mindset is it's okay to make money from art. We don't have to just produce art for the love of the art. You can love art and still make money off of it. Um, look at architects, for example. They're a fantastic example of they make beautiful art, a lot of them, and they make a ridiculous amount of money. And yet musicians spend our entire lives, start at you know, age 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, working their entire life on this career to graduate and make like, what, $30,000 a year? That's absurd. A doctor can start their education when they're halfway through their undergrad and decide they want to be a doctor. And of course, they're going to have a lot of school and they're going to go through a lot of, of education, but they can decide that at age 22, not at age 12. And they can go make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So valuing the fact that you've put a lot of time and energy and care into this, and also a large part of you into the art that you're producing and, and the product that you have and the service that you have, valuing that at a, at a high level is a really important piece of that too. I love that. I can't remember exactly the way you worded it, but something like, I always listen when I'm recording, what, what would be the thing I feature at the beginning? And whatever you just said about like, it's okay to love art and still make money. I mean, that's that kind of sums it up for me. I mean, you got to eat, you got to, there gets to be a point where, you know, a lot of people want to do things like live a normal life, have groceries, buy a car, have a family. And I feel like so many musicians, especially that I've encountered, um, they, they just really don't seem to have that mindset that, that they can in music. And they, they see either they're going to someday just break out into this fantastic career that they can't even imagine what it looks like, or they're going to have to sell out and go work at, I don't know, something they don't want to do. You know, so I think this is a really great balance. And for those of you out there who are wondering, you know, as far as do you need this type of coaching, um, how, how I guess would you decide or help someone decide that, that your business is right for them? Like, is there a kind of person that you're sort of targeting? Maybe they have a smaller studio. Maybe they are newer to music lessons. I mean, what would your ideal client kind of look like? Who should come seek you out? Yeah. So uh, let me start first by saying every student has an ideal teacher and every teacher has an ideal student. So not only can you make money teaching and make money from your art, but you also can pick who you want to work with. You don't just have to take every student that walks in the door. You're going to burn out that way. And when it comes down to, to making money from music um, and, and making money from art, if you're not making money, it doesn't matter how much you love it. At a certain point, it will become a resentment because you're working so hard and you're barely making it. And I meet those teachers every day. They are amazing teachers. They are incredible players. They are wonderful human beings. And I would love to work with them. And, and, and like as a student in a teacher relationship, like if I was a student, they would be my ideal teacher. They're incredible people. And they're just so frustrated. Like they know there's a chance that it could be better, but they're just stuck. So, I mean, that's someone that I can absolutely help and I, I love helping, but when it comes to this program, 
I'm not the only, you know, consultant on the market when it comes to, to music teaching. Um, that was something I definitely found out later after I've been doing this for a while. Like, oh, there's actually a lot of people that do this, which is really cool. There's a lot of variety out there and there's a lot of different people that offer courses. And if you want something more hands-off or hands-on. Um, so for every music teacher, if you're looking for this, there's also an ideal program for you. What I find makes someone really successful in, in our program is three things. Um, first, a sense of consistency. I give my, my clients and the, the studio that I work with a lot of access to meet directly with me, to meet with other members of our team, uh, to meet with other students or other studios and other teachers that are in the program and, and build relationships and learn from them. And also a lot of materials to help you between those meetings and learning and achieving your goal. And you truly can go at whatever pace you want to go. So a, a teacher who is consistent, just like in practice, and is willing to take a couple steps every day and not try to pack like six hours into a Saturday, but just take a couple steps forward on a consistent basis is going to be really, really successful in this program. The second is someone who's not afraid to ask questions. I had a call earlier today with a newer client who is struggling with some of this mindset and was struggling with coming to me with questions. You got a really uh, particularly nasty email from a parent this week that was just really uh, crossing a boundary. It was, it was a total break in report. It was really inappropriate. And she didn't know to come to me or whether to come to me and ask for help with that. And she was stressed about like, she didn't want to be judged if it was, you know, something that she did, if she'd made a mistake. And, and of course the answer was no, it was not her fault at all, but that's also my job. So when you're scared, you're frustrated, you're excited, you're happy, good things are happening, bad things are happening. I want to hear it all, but I can't help if I don't know. So yeah. that, you know, kind of open communication and willingness to ask questions is a big one. And then the final is a sense of urgency. You know, I, I can't make someone do this. I can't make them be successful. So if they are thinking this is a, a thought, but maybe in the future, maybe a year from now, it'd be great to have a, a bigger studio. That's okay. We can meet in a year when you're ready. But if you want this to happen now, or you need this to happen now, then absolutely, I'm, I'm ready to help. And that's a really ideal client for me. I really love how you're talking about focusing on kind of the mindset elements of all this, um, not just the money too, like from just being a successful person or someone deserving of respect, even like, I think there's so many musicians who are just like, well, I can't stand for, stand up for myself. That person pays me $50 mm. an hour or right. whatever. And, uh, exactly what you described with the person who crossed the line. I had an experience with like, like that once. And, uh, it was one of my first experiences actually firing a client. Because um, I'll try and keep it short, but basically I've been going to the lesson uh, every day, and I would I when I go to in home lessons I check my watch, I go downstairs, I teach the lesson for one hour, and then I leave. And so, but I it's an hour lesson, and if you talk to me at the door for five minutes, that's on you. I'm ready to go down in and come up. Right. I, I got other clients <laughs> to get to. your hour. <laughs> exactly right. So yeah. that's not on me. Uh, but I I don't leave the music room though until it's over generally I mean sometimes a minute or two here and there but anyway there was one lesson where the kid went to the bathroom and came back and I was not prepared to wait around after I didn't even comment on it I just left at the normal time but then the dad it was a Friday night I'll never forget because I'd like just got into the bath <laughs> to relax for my <laughs> weekend and I got this text message from this dad who was irate because he accused that I had left early the past four weeks and didn't even give an extra five minutes to his son after a bathroom break and how could I be like this I've now stolen half an hour from them and blah 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 oh I was I felt horrible it ruined my night ruined my bath yeah ruined my yeah. whole <laughs> next day it actually ruined my whole week mm -hmm. until I got to the next lesson I felt miserable the whole week and then I realized I got to the lesson their clock was five minutes fast so I would check my phone I'd go down in their room I'd check their I'd watch their clock for the lesson to pass and get up to leave when it was over in in my mind but the clock was five minutes fast. And I said this to them. I said, you know what? And at the end of that lesson, actually, I said, you know what? I recognize that it maybe was perceived I was leaving earlier, but that was not the right way to go about it. I didn't appreciate it at all. And I won't be back next week. So sorry, I don't want to work with you anymore because that was just a horrible way to deal with this, you know? Yeah. I had a parent early on that was a, of all things, he was a commercial business banker. <laughs> And he paid his tuition late four months in a row. And on the fourth month, he asked for me to waive the late fee. And I said, I'm really sorry, I can't do that. It happened to be that the week before we had rescheduled the lesson because my, unfortunately, my grandfather had passed. And so I'd been gone for a funeral and I had told them exactly what was happening that I had a family member pass and we moved the lesson. So I saw the student twice between when the invoice went out and when they saw me and they didn't pay. And 
I have everything set on an, on an auto pay anyway. He had refused to be on the auto pay. It was a whole other issue, but he paid late and there's a late fee associated with that. And he was furious about the late fee. And when he challenged me on it, he's like, no business just charges a late fee. And I said, well, of all people, you know, that's not true. (laughs) Yeah. When an invoice is late and it's in the business's policy, I am fully within my, my right to charge a late fee. And if you can't respect that and we can't, you know, we, we can't do business on a, on a re- equal level of respect that I have a deadline and you can't meet it, then I'm happy. You know, I, I absolutely adore teaching your son. He's a wonderful child and he's a wonderful student and he's a ton of fun to work with. But if this isn't going to work, that's okay. And I'm happy to refer you to someone else. I love that. You know, I want to go off in the weeds for a minute about this kind of stuff because I psychologically, I realized that a lot of teaching was psychological, um, or sorry, a lot of the business side of teaching was psychological. And what I mean by that is I had a year where I decided, um, I always tried to kind of push the limits a little bit and do more normal business things. And I wanted to accept credit cards, but this was back in like 2012. So not a lot of people were doing it yet. It's 10 years ago now. I can't believe it. But anyway, I wanted to accept credit cards. So I thought the best way to do this would be to add, let's say my rate was $50 an hour. Um, so I would add like 3% or 3.5% or whatever just to cover the fee. Most people complained. I would say that at least 60%, 70% of, the, of them complained. And some some didn't complain and then some just continued paying check. But I wanted them all on credit card because it was easier. And and uh, anyway, but they, they all complained. So the next year I was like, okay, well, I don't want to have that fee because I didn't like having this. One of the other psychological things I did is like to distance music from money. And we can talk more about that in a minute. But so the next year I was like, well, maybe I won't charge three and a half percent. What if I just raise my rate by $10 and include the fee for free? And so it was funny because although everyone complained about paying like fifty two fifty or whatever it was, nobody batted an eye when I raised it to 60 bucks. And I thought that was super weird because I was like, it doesn't. But so sometimes I think it is it is worth trying to integrate your fees and everything into your the rates that you're charging. I think that's really important. But but the second element of it is it's just I want to hear about your thoughts on kind of distancing music from money, because I have a lot of thoughts on that. I have a lot of techniques about that, that I was using very successfully actually. But, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first thing that I encourage pretty much everyone to do, and this isn't the best fit for all studios. This is not a blanket statement, but when it comes to running a private music education business, I highly recommend setting everything up on a flat rate and you put all your clients on auto pay. Because then there is no discussion of money beyond the first meeting. The money just appears in your bank account on the first, second, or third of every month. You know, if everything runs on the first, then it takes a couple of days for it to show up off of Stripe, for example. And then it's in your bank account a couple of days later. And you don't have to talk about late fees. You don't have to talk about you know uh, what the, the invoice dates were. You're not talking about what they paid for, what they didn't pay for. You're not negotiating that. They're also paying in advance. So if they cancel a lesson, it depending on your policy, you can either reschedule it, but don't give them a credit for that. The tuition is not actually for the time spent teaching and it's not for your expertise. It's not for the time that you're, you know, you're allotting to them. It's literally for a reservation in your calendar. I cannot take a gig during that time because it's your reserve lesson time. I cannot teach someone else and make money during that time because it's your lesson time. I reserve that time for you. It is yours. You always have the first right to it. And if you can't make it, then if I happen to have a, an opening somewhere else, then maybe we can, you know, reschedule if someone else also gave up their lesson time that week, or some teachers will do like a group studio class and they'll do a makeup that, you know, if, if a student cancels, they get individual attention during that, right? There's a lot of ways to make that happen, but a flat rate fee where it's paid in advance and an auto pay reduces, I would say 98% of the conflict <laughs> in a parent relationship, especially when it comes to money and tuition. It's an enormous help. Getting that transition can be a little difficult. <laughs> um, you know, navigating that switch if you if you've been having people just hand you money in every single lesson, moving them all of a sudden to an auto pay flat rate monthly fee is a really big transition. So we kind of have to do it in baby steps, but that helps a lot. Serge, I'll just interject for one second because you're totally right. The, the idea at the end of the lesson of handing over the twenty, forty, sixty dollars, or whatever, the reason that people can't negotiate or it's not good to negotiate the lesson that was missed last week at that point is because the money's kind of in your hand, you know? And uh, they say too, the best way to buy a car is to show up with the cash that you intend to pay that your offer is. Like let's say the car is $14,000 and you want to pay 12. Um, don't just call them up and make an offer for 12. 
show up with twelve thousand dollars because if they want the money bad enough they'll take 12 <laughs> you know but if they want more <laughs> you you have to walk away and you can't break your budget either right it's kind of like that with the lesson so if they're in the middle of giving you money for a lesson that they missed last week they feel the pull of that money a lot more than if it just went away on their credit card statement you know and that's not that you know some people feel well, isn't that theft or something no it's in your policy it says you were 24 hours within 24 hours late that's on you it's not my fault you know well, and I can't just put their credit card on file. Like they yes. had to agree to that. Yes, <laughs> yes, they had to yes. log into the, into the online system and save it there and put that in. So it's not like this is something that's a surprise to them, right? That was communicated. But another really helpful piece of this is I really recommend, unless you're a, a new teacher, you're just starting out, don't do a trial lesson. You know, and, and it's not because it's not helpful, but the problem is, especially when we talk about like beginners, if we're talking about a 10 year old, not every day in the life of a 10 year old is a good day. So if you happen to get them on a day where they're like tired, hungry, they didn't sleep well last night, school was really exhausting. They had standardized testing, something's going on. Right. And that's the day of their trial lesson. It could go either way if it's actually a good experience for them or not. And it could be 0% your fault. If it was a bad experience, it could be everything to do with all the other factors in their environment. So instead of putting that much pressure on a lesson where you're probably going to do like 15 minutes, of playing and feedback. Cause you also still have to talk about all the other stuff and the money. It, it puts a lot of pressure on that. And it's not a really full picture. So what I usually do is a consultation and then I would offer a trial month. So if I'm not sure that a student's a good fit for me, then it's kind of a, a reduction in their perceived risk. I would offer them a month where normally I have a two week cancellation notice to, to end tuition and to pause lessons. I'll remove that for the first month. We'll just do four lessons. If it goes really well, we're on the same page at the end of four lessons, we can continue and we'll just keep going from there, but we'll have a quick five minute about that at the end of the fourth lesson. Otherwise, if for some reason it's not the right fit, either party can say no at the end of the four lessons and no harm. There's no, you know, no policy. There's nothing that's going to keep you there. You can absolutely say no, and that's totally fine, but at least they get like a full month of actual progress and they're seeing the impact that you're making. To be clear though, you're charging for this month, right? Yes. Yes. It's your full rate. It's your full rate. It's not a discounted month. Don't do any of that. You know, don't just have them pay the full month, but they just don't have to pay right away. Like you're not going to set them to auto pay. You're going to ask them yes or no. And then you would run the, run the card. Again, it comes from a perspective of musicians insecurity. And this is kind of focused, I guess, on the mindset of music and the mindset of making money and being successful and all these things in music. But like, I'm trying to imagine another legitimate business that offers a trial like a rental car company or massages or a plumber mm. or like... There are examples of this. There are examples of this. Personal training, actually. Really? Is a wonderful example. Yeah. And it's someone that has has worked with a personal trainer for a long time and has a great relationship with, with my trainer. Um, this is something that definitely works well. But what you'll notice is like in the process that I went through, so I'll just kind of give this little anecdote because I think it's helpful. He also did a consultation. So he called me on the phone first and we talked for 20 minutes about what I was looking for. Then he brought me in in person and we did like measurements and we talked about, you know, what I was working on and, and what I would define as my own success, right? At the time I was like, I want to do five pull-ups. Like I'd feel like you know, <laughs> a Marvel superhero if I could do five pull-ups. Like that was what I told him. It was a long time ago, but uh, that, that consultation was really helpful. I got to know him. I felt like I understood him as a person. But he also gave me tangible information. It wasn't information I felt like I could apply on my own, but it was tangible information to really help me. And so I left there and I was like, yeah, you're right. Like looking back, I, I could make some changes to my diet. I could kind of tweak things. And, you know, I, I maybe don't do enough cardio. And, and it, I had thoughts and I had ideas. Then we did a one session trial session that was a paid session before I went on a monthly subscription. But it wasn't really a free trial then, was it? Because you still, like the, the no, actual session. Yeah, so I guess that's the thing that I think works too is like, because it's a personal service, it is nice to meet and discuss your goals and that kind of thing. But nowadays, I think that can also be done on Zoom or the phone. It doesn't necessarily have to be allotted in your, you know, normal teaching hours kind of thing. But but I, I think that definitely, like you're onto something as far as like, you have to pay for it, right? And I think in my mind, the only exception I would make to that is if they were a referral, I would usually give the student who referred them and the new student a bit of a discount um, in that sense, because that's just a, like, again, that's a marketing thing. You know, if you are, you can always give a free lesson to a student that referred to you, you know, the, the referring student, you could give them a free lesson. Remember, and this is a common 
misconception. So I'll just throw this little tidbit out there. If you give someone a discount on your services, the amount that you discounted is not a tax deduction. This is something I see people post incorrectly about in Facebook groups all the time for music teachers. And it scares the daylights out of me because if you're doing this on your taxes, it's not right. Um, so you know, make sure you have an accountant and a tax professional. I'm not one, but you know, make sure you're, you're getting some really good advice from them. But you can buy a thank you gift card and that can be a tax deduction for you because that's a business expense. You could do that instead. You know, that's actually an interesting, I never, I'm surprised I never thought of that. Like instead of giving away my time for free, go pick up a, you know, like a $50 card to a local steakhouse for the parents or something. That, that'd be super nice or a Starbucks card or whatever. People love Starbucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say Star- People love Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> you can do that. Like that's really easy. Or if there's like a nice new local bakery or something in your area, if you want to support a local business, that's a fantastic thing to do is like a gift certificate and just a handwritten thank you note goes so much further. They're going to forget about that free lesson in a month. Yeah. Right. But true. they're never going to forget about that really kind because who writes handwritten thank you notes anymore? Like that goes so much further. I so love that further. idea, actually, the Starbucks card. And because, uh, you know, they could use it 10 mornings in a row, too, maybe and uh, make it make it a amount that's worth it. Like what's a new student worth to you? And, and it's so funny. I was going to ask you about how you went around and asked the other stu- studios um, kind of what they did. Was there a certain tact that you had with that? Because I've had that before. I've been met with varying levels of my wanting to help that person. I mean, I remember one guy who was really great. He, he sought me out to design him new business cards and chatted about like music business and all this stuff. He was super respectful, took me out for a couple of drinks or whatever. I had a great time. He paid me for the cards. He built a good studio, whatever. But someone else called me up one time and was like, hey, are there any, any students who don't want you to trade for a bottle of wine? And I was like, no. <laughs> like... So I think there's tactical That's an interesting ways. Tactic. I haven't it heard that really one. It was really not smart. It was uh, really well. I I see people post in groups all the time and say, "Does anyone have any online students on your wait list? I I could take off your hands." And you know, I, it's well-meaning. Like I, I understand that, and and maybe there could be some kind of a financial exchange there. But it's just it's an awkward ask. So honestly, when I was going to those teachers and asking for advice, what I was doing was either asking them if I could take them out to lunch or ask them to go get coffee. And even like, you know, if I was moving and I wasn't there yet, I would meet them online, but I would send them like a $25 Starbucks gift card first and say, let's meet for a virtual coffee. Like I can't take you out in person, but I'd love to grab you a cup of coffee and pick your brain. And that's very well received as like, can I please, like, I know I'm taking your time. Can I try to make it worth your time? Right. And that's something that is not only polite and good etiquette to do, but it also makes that person feel really valued and they're going to be willing to share more information. You know, obviously like I, I, I love to talk about studio building and marketing. This is something I'm so passionate about. This is, I feel like my life's work and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in this position to find myself here. And I love to answer people's questions, but when people ask me, you know, well, can I, can I just like have a half an hour to like ask you a bunch of questions? Well, I mean, that's what my clients pay me for. So what you're really asking is to get a, a free service. But if someone said, you know, hey, could I take you to lunch and, and catch up with you and ask you a couple of things, that would be different. But asking me to get on another Zoom call when I already have 10 hours of Zoom calls today to answer your questions and then never hear from you again, like that's a really big ask, even if there's a, an existing personal relationship. So keep that in mind with your students too. And it, when they're putting their neck out for you and, and referring you, that's actually a really big deal. And being respectful and grateful for that goes a long way. Well, it's funny because you've made me think, and I've been thinking for a while, and because it's come up. I mean, there's been many times where people have been wanting to contact me about starting their own podcast, or especially a niche podcast, or or whatever. And and I've had even clarinetists like try to contact me and, hey, I want to start a podcast too. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, that's great, but like I, I mean, I think at that point, yeah, it becomes a bit of a, a business transaction. I've got quite a track record now, and and. Uh, I don't necessarily have the time or the need to sit around, you know, letting people pick my brain or whatever they want to do. Right. I had a while ago, some other guy with my other show, it's a Radiohead podcast that I have, but he had a friend who wanted to start some podcasts and could I sit down with him for an hour and answer their questions? And I just said, no, like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So it's hard. It's hard. And it, it's hard too, because this is the music community is our community. And like, we really do want to help all these people. Like you would love to see everyone start a successful podcast. And like, I would love to see every teacher have a thriving studio. They absolutely should. There's 
literally new students being born every single day. So they are out there. There's endless possibility. It, it doesn't matter if there's another clarinet teacher three blocks down from you. There's plenty of opportunity. There's no such thing as, a, as an oversaturated market when it comes to music lessons. We now have the internet. We're in great shape. But when it comes to this type of, of um, relationship, I think this is where, as musicians, our, our business knowledge is almost none but also our relationship knowledge is almost none. We're used to being able to just go get a lesson or go get a trial lesson or um, you know, can, can we just like, can we read duets and like have a, have a glass of wine and can I pick your brain? Like that's a normal thing to ask when you're in music school or when you're taking auditions or can I just like do a mock audition for you and get some feedback and all, you know, and, and we can hang out afterwards or something. That's a normal thing because we're all friends and we think that that's okay. Outside of those immediate friendships though, it is, actually really abnormal and it's unfortunate that it is that way but when you're asking for someone's time it, it, it makes a big difference it, one quick aside on this um I recently I feel like I did a little faux pas I was following someone who's she's an Instagram growth coach and she happens to be someone that lives like five minutes away from me we've met a couple times for lunch um, and, and, and she's a really sweet person and she's got a lot of really good knowledge and insight so she did an Instagram live and I caught the tail end of it and I didn't get it in time to like send my answer, my, my question to her during the Q&A. So I DM'd her and I sent a question and she responded and it was literally just a link to her Calendly and here's my rate and you can, <laughs> you can, you can pay for it. And it was a really stark reminder of, you're right. Like I completely crossed that boundary. I overstepped and asked for something, you know, you had a set time. I didn't make it there, which it should have been more of a priority for me. I should have been there earlier to ask the question. That's my fault. Um, so I, I totally didn't respect that boundary and being that person, it's easy to do. It's not like you're doing it maliciously. I was just like, Oh, I thought of this. I'll send her a message. And at the same time, like she kind of called me out politely and it was totally, totally justified. That's not her being rude. I was not upset about that. I was like, ah, Dang it. That was my fault. <laughs> that was my bad. I feel really embarrassed that I did that. I wonder if it was like an automated response though. It might, honestly, it could be her assistant. You know, I know she's got a, a team and, you know, sometimes people reach out on, on my website and it's an automated message too. And they don't realize that. So, you know, th and that's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I, I felt, felt bad. I'm like, gosh, I, I know her in real life too. So yeah. that's, <laughs> that's awkward. Not just on Instagram life. <laughs> They say some people think it's awkward to charge your friends money for their services or whatever, but but it's also almost more awkward not to, because if you think about it, like um, if your friend owns a restaurant or something, you want to see that restaurant succeed. You want to go there and you're going to buy their coffee and you're going to tell your friends to go there or whatever, and you'll be more than happy to go eat dinner at the restaurant. Um, so why is it that as musicians, we're like, well, <laughs> I'm going to you know volunteer all my time and, and give it away yeah. till there's none well, they're left. They're a friend of the family. I'll teach yeah. them for a discount. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. And I think part of that too is like that love of the art argument again of, well, I just love music and this is someone I also love. And if they love music too, like that's exciting for me. It makes total sense. At the same time, if they really truly, truly value the, the service that you have and the expertise that you have, they'll have no problem paying it. And, and that's something that I think we we work up in our heads more than it actually needs to be a problem. I'll give you a perfect example. So my wife teaches piano and... Um, we met our daughter's new daycare through the a piano student that she has. And, and, uh, she pays for the piano lessons. We pay for the daycare. Yep. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had someone, a, a client recently that was supposed to have a consultation and a consultation, by the way, this is, this is the free meeting. Okay. I don't take any money for that because I don't want to have their, their money in hand, like their 40 bucks or whatever in hand. And then say, eh, this is great and all, but I don't really want to work with you. Thanks. Bye. Like that's weird. So I, I wouldn't charge for the consultation. It gives that, that opening for you to say no. Um, you, you don't have to fill a whole half an hour. It's just however long the conversation goes, which is great. But that consultation is a time for you to interview them. It's not the other way around. And then talk about your pedagogical thesis. What do you believe as a teacher? Who's your niche? Who do you actually work with and help? And who's a good fit for you? What are the action steps that your students are going to take? What are they going to achieve in lessons? What does that process actually look like? Because a lot of non-musicians don't know, like, what do we do in lessons? Talk about that. And then you can give them your vehicle and your deliverables and what you're actually doing as a teacher. You know, there's a weekly lesson, but here's all the other things that you get. And then we can talk about pricing at the end, but only if you think they're a good fit. Now, when we do that consultation, there should be some qualifications to even get there. If you don't teach students under the age of 10, don't take a consultation with a five-year-old student. 
right? So I, I had a client recently who ran into this. He, he was offering a consultation. And when he asked the student's age, they said that they, it was a five-year-old student, five-year-old voice student, which is very young for voice. Um, and, and he really doesn't take anyone under the age of 12. So a very big gap. If it was like 10, maybe he would have considered doing the consultation. And the father was kind of upset and was like, well, I'm a, a professional photographer. You know, I, I would just, I would give you a free headshot session if you can just do the consultation and then you can at least meet her and then decide. It was kind of indignant about it. It was a little inappropriate. And my client came to me and said, what do I do here? Like, I mean, a free headshot session does kind of sound nice. I was like, wait, but now he's going to hold it over your head because the value of that headshot session was way more than the value of your 20 minute consultation call. So now how do you say no to lessons after that? They've got like it's this manipulation really forever. Absolutely. And I said, and dad knows that he's doing it intentionally, that kind of bargaining, the person who comes to you to bargain for lessons, they know that whatever they have, they believe is actually more valuable than what you're offering. And that's why they're offering it because they can just continually hold it over your head. Right. I see a lot of studios who are like, oh, there's one parent who I give a discount to because they do my bookkeeping for me or something like that. You're right. Just if they're a business, let them charge you, you charge them. Cause again, you also can't write that off as a tax deduction if you gave them a discount. So just pay them. Then it's a deduction. Well, and then you're going to get their best <laughs> work too. Cause you know, you can guarantee if yes. the accountant's discounting for you 25%, you're not getting their full <laughs> service, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the students that you're discounting that are at a lower rate, even if we don't mean to at some level subconsciously, it's just not the student that you're giving the most energy and, and intention to because other students pay you and then you get to like that 8.30 at night and they're paying you half the rate. And it can be really hard to be as excited for that student as others, even you know, with, with all the best intentions. It's so funny talking to you because like you, I have so many music business thoughts and like I did so much for so long and <laughs> I've been through kind of it all and you raise another story for me. And it was when I was, I used to grandfather in rates. Like, so if I started one student, let's say at $40 an hour and three years later, I was now charging 50 or 60. I, I wouldn't change them as I was going up the years. And so, um, one year I, I sort of fudged this up though. I, I gave a student, I don't know if it was the wrong contract, but I forgot to sort of do this. So I said my rates were $60, but I just crossed it out and put 45 or whatever. And uh, so the mother came to me at the end of the lesson. This was the only time this ever happened, but she came to me and said, it looks good, but there's a problem. And I said, oh, what's that? And she says, well, it looks like your rate is $60 an hour, but you're only charging us 45. And I said, well, yeah, but you started a few years ago. And again, the insecurity of the musician, right? And she was a psychologist. And she said, if I ran my business like that, or my practice, I guess, she said, I wouldn't be able to stay in business. So she said, I'd like you to please change the rate to your rate. And I was like, wow, thank you. But also good point, <laughs> you know, and this brings me to one of my last questions for you, which is, do you think, and I know what my answer to this is, but I'm interested in yours. <laughs> do you think there's a possibility that we're wrong? Do you think that like some teachers are just going to be able to figure all this out without putting in the music business thoughts, without becoming okay with making money, without talking about any of these things, just kind of willy nilly taking the money every week, doing what they do. Do you think that's, that's possible? Oh, absolutely. And look, I find those teachers all the time too, that they, they don't want to be business owners. They just want to be a musician. Right. And, and you can do that. You can still have a, a thriving business and not have it be a, the business side of things. That's totally fine. You don't have to be as maybe intense is the wrong word, but obviously everything that I'm doing is very intentional. And there's a method here. And, and the real goal is not just have a big thriving studio, but to make it an efficient studio so that maybe all the admin work is, is less and you're not running spreadsheets and tracking everything. But some people are okay with that. They've been doing that way forever. That's how they built it. They like that method. That's fine. I really don't think when it comes to running a business that as long as you're doing everything above board and legally and like you're paying your taxes and you're actually reporting all of your, your income and you're following the terms of service, you're not using Venmo or PayPal friends and family. And um, there's a lot of legal issues there. So if I just shocked everyone, if you are using PayPal or Venmo friends and family, please switch to the business as soon as possible because uh, they are ruthless when it comes to finding uh, violators of that policy and that rule, they're big companies. They're actually the same company and they're not super friendly. So, so make sure you're careful there. But as long as you're doing everything above board, there isn't really a right and a wrong. There's maybe a more efficient and a less efficient. And that's totally fine. If you don't strive to be efficient, that's okay. 
some people also approach practicing this way. They don't want to be you know, orchestral level musicians. And so they're not worried about the most efficient practice on the planet or the most, you know, um, most effective techniques that they can, you know, maximize their time with. They just want to play and that's fun. And that's not right or wrong either. There's a, a huge spectrum here, but I do think that there's a, a large portion of music teachers who have frustrations with whatever they're currently doing and how they're running their studio and they would like it to be more efficient. And if that's anyone listening, I'm, I'm happy to help you with that. And there's a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of studio management software and ways that you can automate things to make that happen for yourself. My goal is not to, to necessarily work with every single studio. My goal is to take those studios that are looking for some better alternatives and help them get there faster. And that's not everyone. And that's perfectly fine. I'm not here to sell you anything. Like that's, <laughs> that's not the point of me giving all the advice. Like I'm happy to just give the advice. And then if we want to work together, cool, we'll talk about it. But the first goal is, can we even, you know, can we even find some solutions? Like, are there things that you can make more efficient? And that's something that you can honestly audit on your own too. You might not even need someone like me to do that. And, and that's okay. I, I don't, again, I'm not, not the fit for everyone and they're not the fit for me. Totally. So we could talk all afternoon, I think, but I want to respect your time. I think and, so too. Uh, <laughs> this but, has been a blast. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So if we're interested in learning more about your, your sort of uh, your, your music business coaching and just more about you, where can we head online to do that? Yeah, you can read a whole bunch about Outside the Box and the, the program that we have at my website. It's kellybearden.com, K-E-L-L-Y-R-I-O-R-D-A-N.com. I'm also very active on social media, Instagram in particular. It's at Kelly Bearden Musician. And if you're looking for some of those tidbits about the efficiency, I do a lot of reels. That's my, my newer thing in the last couple of months is we're kind of taking a, a deep dive into Instagram and reels. And so I, I try to share a lot of education there, take a lot of polls on my stories. And then we also have a Facebook group. So if you go to my website, you can click the link to that group. And again, there's, there's no sales there. Actually, there's no sales allowed at all in that group. Not even for me. The whole goal of the group is just to have a community where if you have questions, if you want to ask what other people are doing and find other options and opportunities, that's the perfect group. It's discussion only. And I try to post a prompt there every day and on my stories, just to kind of give you some insight into what it's like in other studios. I love that. So before we move on to the lightning round, which is just a quick set of questions for those who support the podcast directly on either Patreon or now at the website at clarinet.com slash join, you can actually join directly on the website now, which is really great. Lots of requests for that in the past and now it's available and you can get a free trial actually for 30 days with code. I think it's try live, but check it out when you're there. Clarinet.com slash join. Um, so we will do the lightning round in a second, but my last question for you sort of twofold. Did I ask you everything that you think I should have asked? And <laughs> do you have any questions for me? <laughs> yeah, no, I think we covered it really, really well. Um, I think the the thing I'd love to hear just a little bit more about, and we talked a lot about your your teaching stories, but what are some things that you and you were running your own studio? Because I think maybe this might resonate with some people. Is there anything in your studio that looking back felt inefficient? Like it just felt like you had a lot of admin work or there was something that you were kind of spending a lot of time on, was there anything that really drove you crazy about running that part of your business? <laughs> Early on, yes. But by the end, I felt like I had actually perfected it. And that's one reason why I kind of moved on. I was like, I think I've found the pinnacle of what teaching <laughs> teaching privately at home could look like. <laughs> so what, what that ended up being is I solved all sorts of problems. Um, and I should almost sell like it, the, the, the solutions I made as a course or something. But, but um, like my music contract and the way it was laid out and stuff was like, I want to say it was almost perfect in the sense of like, I took all these sort of price psychology and marketing ideologies and like integrated them into the contract. And I felt a little weird about it at first, but I realized that people expect quality marketing these days. They expect it on the menu at the restaurant. They expect it at, when they're buying airline tickets, like they expect it when they sign up for lessons. And, and so it's, I guess three of the quick tips I did was uh, the first one was extreme separation of music and money because I took what you did and I think I took it almost too far for some people, but I gave them the option to not do that. <laughs> so what I did is I, I actually gave people the chance to pay for the entire semester up front. And for this, I offered 5% off and I didn't expect anyone to do it. And this is another important element of marketing is like you can have premium options and things. People don't have to sign up for them, but they act as what's called a price anchor. So so I would list the yearly tuition and then like the monthly tuition and the per lesson tuition. And it would go up each time kind of per hour. So if you did the math, it would be much better to go with the whole year, right? Another thing I did was this was a method of collecting payments, like the credit cards. You know, we talked about that, I guess, with the, um, 
the uh, rates being included with that. So I wasn't adding that as an extra fee. But then the last thing I did, I, I called it cancellation insurance. And so what I would do is instead of having a cancellation policy, um, I said you could choose how much extra you wanted to pay per lesson over the course of the year to give you various levels of flexibility to cancel. Zero dollar cancellation insurance was there is no option to cancel. <laughs> Maybe it was a dollar a lesson was you have 24 hours and I think it was like 250 or $5 a lesson was you can cancel five minutes before I don't care. You can cancel whatever you want. However, I operated kind of on a punch card system too. So you bought 30 lessons for the year. Once you used them up, they were used up. You could add additional ones or something, but, and if you didn't use them up, that was also on you. So you could cancel your lessons all day long, but if you never came, you'd still give up your tuition. <laughs> so anyway, I guess those were kind of the three sort of main things, I suppose. But there's, I got a whole like list of them. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting once you, I bet it's really interesting for you to see too what other people do on their contracts and kind of how it works. Well, and I see a, I see a lot of really good contracts and I see a lot of really messy contracts. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the things when it, when it comes to a contract, if you have to over justify and over explain your policies and why they are the way they are, people don't want to read the justification. Plus every justification opens the door to argument, right? When I raise my rates, it's just, as of this date, this is the new rate. Thanks for your continued support. Okay. Best time to raise your rates, by the way, is right after your winter recital. January 1st is perfect. Have a recital in December. Announce the rate increase and the recital date in the same email. I've done that for years. I've raised my rates as high as 15% in one go. And I've literally never had anyone drop because of my rates. I've never even had anyone complain or say anything about it. So that's just a, a small pro tip. Uh, but as as this is you know, kind of getting back into the rates. Don't justify that change. Don't justify why you're doing anything. Just tell them what the change is. And if they have questions, they'll reach out to you. But usually they don't. If the price of a burger goes up, they don't list all the reasons the supply chain was affected and why that income, you know, or why, why there's that change in that price. As a consumer, I don't care. But if you tell someone, like, I'm, I'm raising my rates because of inflation, and you raise it 9%, they'll come back and say, well, inflation was only 7.5%. Why'd you raise it 9 <laughs> Exactly. The more you explain, the less it makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So efficient contracts are, are always really, really helpful. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing your, your music knowledge, your business insights, and everything you have to offer. Do you want to invite anyone listening to head on to kellyreardon.com and also your Facebook page? Um, I think there's a link to it from the website there. Can anybody access that? Is it, is it public or is it just for your clients? Yeah, it's public. Anyone can join right now. We have about 1.1 thousand members. I post a little prompt in there every day. It's something about running a studio, you know, teaching, um, pedagogy, the, the breadth of knowledge is really wide there, but we always get a lot of comments and it's just a really fun way to learn what other studios are doing. And you can always respond and you know, kind of pick people's brains too. It's a really inviting group. No sales, just discussion. It's one of my favorite things that I, that I have in my toolbox right now. I love that. Very cool. Thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. I hope we'll get to connect again soon. Thanks for having me, Sean. I appreciate it. As musicians, we are always trying to improve our playing and understanding of music, but we're often hesitant to work on the business and marketing side of music. If you're looking to make more money teaching, fill up the gaps in your studio and find ideal clients to work with who leave you feeling energized instead of drained after a day of teaching, you need to check out clarinetist Kelly Reardon's Outside the Box community. Get a free 30-minute consultation and personalized recommendations from Kelly by mentioning Clarinet when you register at kellyreardon.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-R-I-O-R-D-A-N.com. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code CLARINET at checkout. Imagine a read that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reads, the world's leading synthetic read brand made right here in Canada. The European cut read is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crotta Freddy, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. 
Learn more at your local music store, or you can now save 10% on your Legere reads with code Clarinet at checkout at Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. <laughs>